Before we begin the episode, I would like to thank our sponsor, Feel Queens, an Irish-owned GEA and leisurewear brand created by two intercounty players, Una White and Orla Duff. The girls have put aside their intercounty rivalries to create Ireland's first ever GEA glove, specifically designed and tailored fit to the female hand. Feel Queens are empowering future generations and offer a 15% team discount on gloves and are proud to be stocked in 10 stores nationwide. Having only started this venture in 2021, they have steadily grown their product line to include their original Empower gloves, bobble hats, snoods and water bottles. They have also just announced their brand new Blackout glove which are now available to buy on their website feelqueens.ie. You can find out more information on their social media at feelqueens which will be linked in the description box below. Welcome back to the Sideline Live podcast. You can follow us over on Twitter and Instagram at the Sideline Live. We'd love to hear from you. On episode 71, I am delighted to be joined by 2021 Senior Footballer of the Year and Mead star Vicky Well. On this episode, we discuss her underage career, managing the peaks and troughs of Mead football, the 2021 season and so much more. I thoroughly enjoyed chatting with Vicky, so I hope you enjoyed the episode. Hi Vicky, thanks a million for joining me on the podcast. No worries at all. Before we get into everything, um, I suppose five months since the All-Ireland final, is your mum still watching it on TV? Yeah, absolutely. She definitely is. I know it was on over Christmas, so she was uh, delighted to be able to watch that again. So she's she's enjoying still watching it. Good stuff. Uh, underage for you, Vicky, what were you like as a player growing up and when did you start to hit the inter-county ranks? Um, yeah, underage, I probably would have... Um, I started with Meath under 12s, you know, we got we got brought in and I would have had the same management up until under 16. So, you know, I had a really, really enjoyable uh, underage um, experience with Meath. Um, we would have been successful as well at kind of under 14s. We won Leinster and stuff like that. And there's a good there was a good core group of us. Um, I probably played most of my football at number three, to be honest, up until about 60, under 16. So that was my kind of, it was definitely a shift of a shift of, of a position. Um, I was probably three and six for a lot of that. And then even when Paul came in to me, I was playing six, I suppose, for the first kind of year that he was there. So, yeah, I suppose underage was, it's kind of a different experience, but um, it was it was really enjoyable all the same. And, you know, I, I loved every second of playing with me, you know, every time. I got to go to one of those blitzes in Carlo or talk out for me I absolutely loved it I didn't realize you were a defender what what was it like moving to the forward line and what were you like as a defender what was the thinking to have you in the back line um, I suppose maybe thinking the back line like that breaking breaking out and kind of maybe I probably wouldn't have been a, a, the best man marker, but I suppose I was kind of solid and sturdy and kind of held the held the line and stuff like that. Um, and then shift into forwards, I suppose I probably I had played there kind of sometimes, so it probably wasn't a huge um, huge shift. But you know, I really enjoyed it. And to be honest with you, I don't care where I am once once I'm on the pitch. That's that's my main concern. Um, and then after that, I'll play anywhere. Yeah, that's a good point. At what age did you start doing extra things away from team sessions, kind of focusing on your own strengths or weaknesses? I'd say even maybe moving from the back line to the forward line, you probably thought, oh, there's a bit of a you know shift here in what my role is. Yeah, I suppose it probably would have been under 14s. I think um, the manager we had, Michael Griffin, kind of would have said, like, he would have given us all a few bits to work on. And, you know, I was the type of person that, like, whatever he said, I was like, I'm going home to do it straight away. And I was like, on the way home from a training session, trying to get dad to bring me to the pitch, that kind of way. Um, so, yeah, like, any anytime I could have got out and d- did my extra bit, like, I was always, I was just obsessed with football. So it was kind of, it wasn't, I never viewed it as, like, something I had to do. It was something that I wanted to do. And if there was a chance to go out in the green and kick the ball with my dad, or my or my younger sister Sarah you know I was I was always at the door ready to go okay interesting and at an underage level what do you think your was your biggest strength in terms of like and not really at underage but what do you think your evolution was from underage and looking at your strengths back then to now um yeah I I don't think I don't think I soloed a ball in like in club football for a first year and then I remember doing it and I was like wow this is this is revolutionary you know I can actually (laughs) run further with the ball and take it kind of further with the pitch so I definitely wasn't um, a very skillful player underage I suppose I probably relied on my strength and speed and stuff like that but then you know as you get older you kind of can't can't rely on that as much you know I was definitely kind of a bit taller and bigger and stuff underage but then you know come under 14 under 16 everyone kind of catches up with you so it was kind of those those small bits like I think just skill wise and stuff like that would have been something I was I, I tried to focus on 
Okay, that's interesting. So when you started soloing then, I think you just started doing laps of everyone, was it? <laughs> <laughs> not quite, not quite. A, a bit of a ping pong game, you know, one up, one down and the kind of thing. But um, yeah, no, it's definitely a, a big moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was going to ask, actually, what is your game based more on work ethic or natural talent? But I get the sense it's a lot of the foundation stuff you've done is, is really, your, you know, your work ethic there. Yeah, I think it's probably something I, I maybe in my f- first maybe year or two up in, in Meath, um, coming from underage, you know, you kind of, I, I obviously knew that I did have natural talent, but then like, it's very quickly found out if you're relying on that, I think, especially at, at senior ranks or even in, in like senior football. Um, I think you know, you can only go so far if you do rely on your natural talents. I mean, some people are unbelievably naturally talented, but, you know, and I was even, we went down and myself and Dougie were just briefly chatting to the media in the 14s yesterday. And I was just kind of even like on the way up in the car, just even saying to myself, like any game that I look back on that I think like, if I was to reflect and if I analyse my game and stuff like that, that I think I've had a good game. It's it's not the games where, you know, you score an unreal goal or you score a point. It's kind of like, when I think to myself, it's like, oh, like I got those turnovers or I did, I worked hard off the ball and did kind of stuff like there are things that kind of stand out in my head. Look, obviously you want to be scoring goals as a forward, you want to be scoring points, but it's those kind of like extra small bits that would kind of stand out and uh, that I would kind of think back on. Brilliant. What advice would you give girls at under 14, 16 minor that are going into, uh, probably that under 16 age group didn't have that under 14 intercounty experience minor a big jump from under 16 they didn't have much there either what advice would you give them kind of moving into their first serious inter-county competition uh yeah well my main thing is to enjoy it like I just remember like anytime I think back to underage football like I kind of my first thing isn't like the wins or losses we had it's just like how much I enjoyed it and even now like most like if one of the top three reasons that I play football is because of the girls that we have on the teams, whether it's club or county, you know, they're some of my best friends. So w- one of my main, main advices would be to make friends with the girls on the team, you know, make that effort and integrate into the team. And it's it's difficult, I think, in some ways when you're coming up to maybe if you're joining at under 16 or minor and girls have been together from under 12s or under 14s, you know, and they have that, that, that those few years of friendships. But, you know, everyone has a similar interest, a similar goal on the team. And it's I think it's it's a very kind of welcoming environment. Um, and well, any teams I've ever been involved in have been so my main advice would be to yeah to integrate properly on the team and kind of you you get out what you put in and you know the closer you are and the better friends you are with the team I think the better you play on the pitch and it's it's easier to kind of be more comfortable on the pitch as well. You mentioned there are the three particular reasons why you play football would you be willing to share the other two reasons why? Oh well I, I don't know if I have the exact three there um, I, well, I, my main thing yeah I suppose is the girls that we play with you know and then I suppose just how much I enjoy it and it's kind of you know it's a place where you can you can challenge yourself as well and p- push yourself and see, see what you can achieve so it's kind of the, the, the things I, I like about it obviously. You mentioned Emma Duggan there before uh, are you both are you still getting free coffees in me is that still a thing? <laughs> <laughs> we paid for a few coffees now we paid for a few coffees. <laughs> and your sister uh, she would have been she's a couple she's two or three years younger than you. She's, she's three years younger than me yeah. Three years younger so what's it like her, with her coming up behind you I know you did play with together for a little while I know she's now injured what's that like having your sister there on the team? Yeah, Sarah actually had Toria her second cruise. She was in the 2020 All Ireland. She's actually fully back training now with me, Brilliant. so it's great to have her back in. Um, I suppose as um people and players, we are two very different people. Um, but I suppose that's you know that's probably why I get on with her so well as well. Um, I think you know to to have someone to that you're so close to, and you know to, she has been involved in successes that we've had in club and county in the last few years. So you know to always have someone like that on the team or going to a match or just someone to talk to and stuff like that that you know there's minimal explanation needed and obviously we understand each other very well so yeah no I'm, it's 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 unbelievable to have her involved and you know to I'm really looking forward to hopefully being back on the pitch with her this year and it, I, I've always loved playing with her. Brilliant what was it like making the jump to to the adult rank in Mead I'm um, kind of at that stage Mead football wasn't what it is now can you give us a bit of an insight into the years that uh, kind of preceded your, your win this year or 2021? <laughs> Yeah, I don't think my um, experience with joining the senior team would probably be the same as girls that are coming up now. I think it's it, me football was in a very, very different position. I was 16 when I first came up and still on the minor team and stuff like that. And we just we just didn't really have um, great numbers, to be honest. You know, there was a lot of retirements um, and like they were girls that had given 10 and 12 years to me football. So there was no there was no begrudgement there by anyone. You know, they'd really done they'd done what they could do for me football. And they were they were unbelievable. You know, even the likes of um, Jenny Rispin 
didn't it was out celebrating us this with with us this year it was as much as a win for her as it was for us you know the amount of time she'd given to me in football um but yeah we had a few a few tough years you know we kind of had a bit of change of management we didn't have a, a kind of a consistent management team and then we definitely didn't have a consistent um consistent team even like you know there'd be girls coming in for a few trainings dropping off and then we'd be trying to get get a team together and there was just no there was no flow there's no consistency to the team and we got relegated to division three we got relegated well we we went down to intermediate that was kind of our, our own choice well I, I definitely didn't vote for it but in, the, in hindsight it was it was a great thing for for our county in the end um yeah it was just a case of not having you know people a lot of girls were traveling a lot of girls were kind of there was no one in, in, inside um enticement for people to play me in football to be honest it wasn't like it wasn't seen as a as a as a good thing maybe oh. um you know for me as a 16 year old maybe it was that naivety for me that I couldn't understand why people didn't want to so like I was like the opportunity came around I was like Jesus absolutely I didn't even think twice about it whereas there was other girls my age that were kind of like why why would you be doing that like as in they're they're winning nothing they're they're not training hard they're not doing anything so um, it definitely took a few years to kind of get us back on track. And, you know, when Paul and the lads came in and they just completely wiped all, wiped a clean slate, you know, when they just set standards from the get go. And, you know, it, like even with them, like it wasn't as if we were um, hugely successful straight away. Like it did take take time and there was lots of losses and we weren't really being consistent either. So that, that was definitely things we tried to work on. And, you know, we had in the last few years, we've had a core group of minor girls coming up, which I think has made such a, such a, such a difference. You know, when they come up in a group, I think it's much easier to integrate onto a team. Um, maybe in previous years, we've only had one or two minors coming up and a lot of girls dropping off. So when they come up in a, in a group, I think it's, it's a lot easier for them to kind of make an impact on a team. What were some of the standards that the guys brought in when they, you know, came into management originally? Can you think back to what the team was like before and kind of the initial, did you realise there was a really big jump to what they brought in? Um, there, there wasn't, there wasn't a, bit, a, a huge jump. I think a lot of the girls that came back in the year that Paul and them came back um, would have been involved in Mead when it was kind of going well and kind okay. of had those expectations and standards. So it wasn't a huge shift. And even from from us, from the, the group of girls from my age that were involved in under sixteen as a minor, like we would have been successful. So we would have had good standards and stuff like that. But it was just kind of setting the law maybe and kind of just acknowledging like what what was expected of us and what they would give to us as well okay just on your own career um that 2018 team in dcu that won the o'connor cup i was looking at the team sheet the other day how close was that team to an intercounty standard like when you look at it i don't know how many all-stars and how many uh, all Ireland winners are now on that were on that team but have now accumulated so many awards and personal accolades yeah, it's just, it was a serious team, and even now, I think like if you had that team together again, like it'd be it'd be fairly fairly unreal. Um, yeah, it was a really good experience to be involved with. You know, there was really there was great players there, and it was a really good team environment as well. I think I was in the second year in college, yeah, when we won that O'Connor Cup. So you know, some of the girls were a lot of the girls were in final year that year, and they'd be trying to push to win it and everything. So yeah, it was great, and I think probably to be honest, like I think that team could could beat a lot of intercounty teams. There was a serious serious panel that year, um. So yeah, it was great to be involved. With. What's it like going to whether it's me or you know with the girls we've just named that DCU team, training at that that standard and learning from players and just that because I get the sense obviously you know when you're playing against an opposition there's going to be a high level of even at club like the teams you're coming up with with Dunboyne but even at training what's it like going in night in night out you know really hard A, a and B games or even just tackling or or back and forward drills yeah I think it's unreal and like to be at that standard to have those though to be able to have those games where you it fully is it's, it's you say a and, B, a and B but it's it's 15 on 15 and that like there is three or four people competing for the exact same spot that you know there's marginal differences and that's something that excites me about football and that they're the type of teams that I love to be involved with that where you're constantly on your toes and you're constantly kind of looking around and seeing you know someone that's in your position like what what they're doing that maybe you don't you don't have currently or something that you have that they don't have currently and kind of not molded into the exact same player but kind of taking the best bits from other players and kind of seeing how people react to different situations or different 1v1s and stuff like that like I think it's it's a it's a really good place to be in football where what have you taken from other players or even growing up who would you try try emulate in the back garden um yeah I don't know if there was a an emulation of anyone um specifically to be honest but just even you know like when we were younger just going into the the all-earned final days and seeing like 
just even seeing how different girls take freeze and stuff like that and just you know obviously you have to find what works for you but just kind of even looking at how other people kick the ball or you know what they do in a, in a high pressure situation or if they're if they're being tackled by three players or if they're breaking a tackle or how they do things just those small little things that I kind of like to observe and just it's just interesting to see. Would you be one of those like nerdy nerds of the game trying to look at video <laughs> and ask some people questions? Um, yeah, I definitely, I definitely find a few questions now anyway in training. Yeah. Uh, Dunboyne have a pretty spectacular run. 2015, I think it was uh, All Ireland Junior Champions. Then 2017 Intermediate Champions. I know you came up, you didn't win the Senior Championship this year. You lost in semi final. But what's it like going on that run with your club uh, and having that dominance in me? Then in and this year breaking through and and beating and um, kind of overthrowing uh, Fox Cab out of their their six in a row. Yeah, it's been it's been unreal. Um, I think like that, it's been a, a steady process of kind of learning together and growing together as a team. And 2015, like Junior All Ireland was outrageous, and then we went on and we lost the, the intermediate club final in Meath in 2016. So we kind of came back together and said that like we really really wanted to push on and that we knew there was more in the group. And then obviously 2017 went went very well as well. Then it took us a few years in senior to kind of to kind of you know get our bearings and just realise that it's it's a different standard like whether it's county or club you know senior level is senior level, so you know it took us a few years and we had that loss in 2019 and um, we lost to Simonstown and then came back and won it in 2020 and 2021, but I think there's just in in Des Moines, like as in teams I've been involved with, like there's the likes of Fiona O'Neill, Julie Kavanagh, Dee and, and Diva Thompson, like therefore the maybe older girls on the team, but they've always kind of, you know, with us, I think set the standards and just like, they're still some of the fittest people on the team. And they just, in every match, you know, like you can just see how much it means to them. So I think when you have that kind of trickling down to us, let's say the age group of the 23 to 26 bracket, and then there's a core group of us and that that can trickle down to the younger girls that are coming up now who are like unbelievably talented as well. I think that's kind of been, and maybe we didn't have that before 2014 and stuff like that. We didn't okay. have that kind of effect of older players and younger players, whereas now we definitely do. And, you know, there's just even the management we have in our grace and just stuff like that has kind of, I think, helped propel us to, to the standard that we are now. Mm-hmm. You're putting the the lads team under serious pressure. I know the <laughs> county final was a double this year, uh, with the men's and women's final the first time ever. I think anywhere in the country that 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 has happened. But Leinster have now announced that the Leinster final will be a double header with the men men and women. I know and GPA yesterday. There's been no so much news about yeah. lately, but they put a put forward the motion about the associations coming together. How big is that as an intercounty player to see the support now for the women's game grow? Like even last year, the the equal um sort of financial support in terms of uh, costs. What's that like to see as an intercounty player and see the supports finally come in for the game that maybe some of the the girls you've named there, the older teammates, wouldn't have seen maybe ten years ago. Yeah, it's kind of a, a breath of fresh air to be honest, and honestly, a bit of a bit of a relief. I think you know to see see the work the GPA have done and like just even seeing how they amalgamated you know the two organizations and just just seeing how an organization can work if people want it to and if people have to have similar goals and understand you know the basic principles of, of equality to be honest um i think it's it's unbelievable and like i just like i'm in awe of the people that work for the gpa and, and the work they've done for for you know Ladies Gaelic football, Kamogi, all of the all of the four codes, and um, and then just even seeing yeah, I suppose the motion, you know, for for the four codes to be under the same umbrella of the organisation. Like I just think it kind of it kind of has to happen at this stage, you know, and just all these things that are slowly but surely becoming the norm, and hopefully it can it can continue. Mm-hmm. I think the next step as well for ladies football is to see a full Crow Park on, on Ireland final day. But what's it like being a role model for younger girls in Mead or across the country? What's it like having that interaction with them? And you probably get a few messages every now and then, but just kind of realizing, you know, I'm in a privileged position here. Yeah, and it absolutely is a privileged position. Um, I suppose for like you know you get those little letters or stuff like that from from young girls and even just meeting young girls out and about and young boys as well which has been unbelievable to see um I think it kind of definitely took me a while to to realize you know to to acknowledge that maybe it is a bit of a role model position but you know for to have any impact on young girls and boys and to continue to get them to play sports or enjoy sports or just enjoy meet football maybe and just football in general like it's it's something that 
um, maybe you're not conscious of every time you're going to training, but then you realize that it's, you know, it's more than sport. It's more than just that win on the day or that loss on the day. And it kind of, it does have an effect on people like, and it can definitely brighten people's moods and stuff like that. So I think that's definitely something we're conscious of um, this year in Mead, in Mead Ladies. You know, we want to, we want to bring joy to people. We want to, for people to enjoy our football and stuff like that. So it's definitely, like you said, yeah, a completely privileged position. Uh, growing up I think with girls I think it's around the 14 age and even 18 when people start be- getting busy with college and work and stuff a lot of girls drop out of sport how come you didn't drop out and and was there any stage at which you were discouraged um to be honest no there was no stage where I was discouraged and um if if I had it was almost the opposite I, during my mocks you know my mom was trying to say like you need to stop going to training so as much as but like playing with the minor and the senior team and there was a time we were driving home from a match in Limerick and I was kind of studying for my English mocks the next day in the car beside my mom but to be honest with you it was something that helped me so much in my studies in, in leaving cert and um, it was a time where I could guilt-free kind of get away from the books and kind of just I got my exercise in but I also got like so much enjoyment out of seeing my friends and then I was I was much better kind of planning my day when I knew that I only had a certain amount of hours to come home and do my work it wasn't kind of it, de- it definitely I know maybe that doesn't help everyone but for me yeah. it really really helped me and kind of gave me that structure and routine that I needed to to kind of do well academically but then also in sport as well I think as well maybe maybe it was the teams I was involved with you know like that I, there was no discouragement from under 14s to 16s and stuff like that. The just the the pure enjoyment that I got out of it. Um, I was always kind of conscious of how much joy it brought me. That you know it was something that if it was taken away from me, it was it was it was a punishment. So um, yeah, I think think it definitely. You know when you're that age, you know 16, 17, 18. There's so many more distractions and there's so many more things that come into play. But I don't think it's a case of you know being hard on yourself and saying that you have to be like if you step away from an inter-county kind of team at that age or your club team or whatever it is like it doesn't have to be you know the highest standard or something for you to still enjoy it or still to get those benefits from it you know it's I think it's just a sport in general or a passion even to be honest is what I think is so important for young girls to just have something some form of outlet they can go to and like I said it's it's not you know sitting on your phone for an hour which we, we, which we all do but you know it's something that actually brings happiness to your life and kind of if it's it, even better if it's a case of it's social meeting your friends going for a walk going for a run doing a gym class or something like that I just think it's so important to have some form of outlet especially at that age. Mm-hmm. The 2020 season obviously very different for a number of reasons but what was it like coming in after losing the two previous finals um what was that like coming back into 2020 when after all of the madness and getting back together as a group and kind of realigning the focus and looking towards the the, you know looking towards I'd say the goal at the very beginning of the season was to win that intermediate championship yeah absolutely it was um I think because 2019 we just reset so quickly and knew that that was our goal again we kind of just did the exact same thing in 2020 and it was kind of just like we knew it was a long road ahead and it was kind of at the end like you know you still have to we were still focused on the league like we we really wanted to achieve and do well in the league that year and um, so that was the first goal so it's kind of nice that you can split the season in two nearly mm-hmm. and have those two separate goals and then kind of base where you are in the league and look forward to the championship so it was kind of just a case of get back training and get into the league so you kind of you kind of do forget about let's say that that ultimate goal during the league because you have a separate goal and something to keep you occupied but then I think once the league's over you know you're conscious of it but then conscious enough to realize that it's it's a one game kind of a thing as well and that we we knew ourselves as well that from 2018 and 2019 that it's kind of a, a one game at a time process because you know it, it doesn't always work out the way you want it to definitely um just with that final can you reflect back on what's it like being in an empty crow park just even in comparison to 2021 and the noise and you know the hill was open and the cusick and the full cusick was open how weird was it at the time and you probably did it sink in how weird it was at that point no I don't think it did because we had so many games with no crowds in 2020 and like you almost just got used to it as quickly as you do to having a crowd it wasn't until we had the crowds back for the Cavan semi-final in the league this year that I kind of was like oh like how much you do miss it and like how much of a difference it does make kind of it wasn't yeah until you had it back you realised what it was like Um, I suppose Crow Park itself 
definitely was different because in previous years, you know, we, we've been tra- we'd been training to how we'd get messages across the team and stuff like that because you can't hear anything. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you can hear, you know, your manager on the sideline completely perfect, and you can hear absolutely everything that's going on. So it definitely was a complete shift, and probably helped us a bit to be honest on the day um in some ways but then obviously you flip that to 2021 and the crowd helped us so much and that momentum and that kind of spirit so it's kind of it's kind of a catch-22 of realizing which i definitely prefer the crowd um all day though yeah i have to say as a as a fan watching from home it was actually really cool to hear what the manager was saying now i know some sometimes they couldn't actually put in what they were saying but um what sort of difference does a crowd make in a final does it is it really that 16th man does it play into it some players say that they don't hear a thing during finals i don't know i don't know what it's like so what's it like with the with the fans there and what kind of effect do they have on the game yeah i think it's kind of a tough one um obviously i agree that you kind of maybe don't hear them in the sense of like you're not focused on it hugely because you know you're so honed in on the game and so focused and if you kind of start focusing the crowd you're maybe losing your attention and stuff like that but i think for those pivotal moments of you know, a block or a turnover or a, a score, you can definitely ride the wave of, of that crowd, you know, and kind of keep that momentum going as well as such. So, yeah, I think obviously, you know, if, if you're in that leading position and you, your crowd are on your side, you're, you're laughing. But um, yeah, I, I think obviously it, it's unreal to have to have supporters there just, just regardless. Can you describe what it's like? I think they call it like the zone or something when you just get into that pure focus, 100% attention on the game. And do you ever find that you kind of leave that that zone and you kind of have to bring your mind back to it yeah I suppose there definitely is times during a game where you find yourself leaving that zone and it's just kind of a it's something I'm conscious of to just a quick reminder just you know focus on the next ball and just kind of get back into into that kind of mode Um, obviously you know certain situations arise in a match you know whether it's kind of a, a stop and play or kind of you know a big score or a big miss or a big you know kind of a lost chance and stuff like that so it's just kind of acknowledging it and then getting back to it as quickly as possible but yeah I think when you're in that kind of zone I think a lot of it a lot of the thinking maybe goes out goes out of the window you know you're not consciously thinking I think it's kind of comes down to like muscle memory and you know just knowing knowing your task obviously you are thinking in some ways but just you're so so sure of your job that you're not really consciously thinking of what your next move is the entire time okay and during a game what would your self-talk be like um, you know your role and you know your thinking and even I'd say the, you know it's only like that natural instinct about decision making but during the game what, what's your self-talk like? Um, I suppose it probably depends Um, you know if if I'm being man marked and you know I'm after losing a ball or something like that or I've lost a 50-50 challenge you know in my head it would always just constantly be like next ball next ball and just be repetition of that kind of to myself Um, I kind of would just have a very short term memory on the pitch and um, you know, it's just I literally try just focus on the on the now as much as possible, and probably not doing a huge amount of self talk during play, but maybe during the setups and stuff like that of where I'm supposed to be or what I'm supposed to be doing. Kind of just reminding myself, just saying like it wouldn't be long sentences; it's just kind of be quick, short bullet points and stuff like that. Would probably be my my main thing. Okay, uh, 2020 final. Um, I think your mom said it to you. Uh, he you gave he gave you the ref gave you a yellow card so you could celebrate with your sister on the sideline. What was it like getting over the line and realizing, look, we have a great chance at, or we we're going to be moving up here to senior level. Yeah, it was unreal. Um, yeah, and I suppose Sarah was obviously injured on the sideline, so I got to celebrate with her there, which was great. But um, yeah, I think. I think because of the circumstances of 2020 and COVID-19 and everything that was going on, you know, we didn't really get to spend too much time with each other after the final. Mm -hmm. I think it was a day or two and kind of the whole country shut down again for like a five or six week period. So there wasn't a huge amount of reflection done on the 2020 final, I don't think. Um, And then it was kind of straight into our own individual training. We were all given programs. We were all given gym and running programs to keep us keep us going. And, you know, at that time, we didn't even know football was going to be happening. So you're kind of doing it, kind of doing it for the love of it and enjoyment of it as well. You know, like I was happy to go out. Like, I, you don't know if you had that huge ultimate goal because football was so up in the air at that time. But then, you know, when we got the confirmation that league was happening and you're back into it and, it was just exciting to be honest and it was kind of you know it was finally getting to where we wanted to be to test ourselves against the teams that we wanted to test ourselves against Mm -hmm. so it was you know the division two league was obviously there's a lot of senior teams involved in that so it was it was great for us to be able to base ourselves maybe off that um before going into championship totally um i won't dwell on it too long but after the 
the final in 2020 yeah you spoke a lot about sort of the verbal abuse that you got um through a number of years in your career um unfortunately a club mate of mine got similar words were said to her in a, in a game um what do you think the association can do to eliminate this unnecessary commentary and abuse to players because I know as an underage coach if that was said to one of my players like we don't know what's going on behind closed doors with anybody what do you think the association the association can do to try I know it's only a limit to what they can actually do but try eliminate this from the game yeah um I I don't I don't think I have the perfect answer for it to be honest um I think it's just a case of you know continuously calling it out and just acknowledging that it's 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 not um it's not okay it's not good enough um yeah, I, I I don't know to be honest. I don't I don't know um, I don't know what the what the perfect solution is. I think you know there's always going to I think unfortunately there always is going to be a small element of it in sport. Mm-hmm. Um, I think from my own perspective, you know, just at the moment and maybe even a few years ago, when I mentioned it. Like I was I was definitely over it in that sense, but I was just kind of acknowledging it. Maybe I didn't realize how much of an impact it would have on certain people. But um, I think it's just a case of being sure of yourself and and you know having that confidence in yourself of knowing how hard you've worked or or what you're doing outside of football or on the pitch you know um and kind of maybe I, I know it's not as easy to say as to, to try and block it out because it's definitely not always possible and it's and it's you know a lot easier said than done but I, I, I don't have a, a perfect answer for what the, the association can do unfortunately. Mm. You mentioned the league there gaining momentum and um, you won the division two league what was it like kind of you mentioned there even there's senior teams in that league was the league kind of the realization that you know we're not just here to kind of be happy with you know and be content with staying up senior we have a real crack at this here yeah absolutely and there was definitely that acknowledgement that we weren't just staying up senior like it wasn't just a case of we want we don't want to get relegated like that was never never okay. mentioned kind of really never our intentions um we'd kind of known that we'd done a significant amount of work to get there that we were sure like I think if we'd gone up in 2018 and maybe even possibly 2019 I think um I don't know if our team was would have been fully ready um, and okay. as much as it's those losses were painful I think maybe in, in hindsight you know we were a strong intermediate team at that stage but we didn't quite have those attributes that's needed for senior level um, and I think those losses and those kind of stages taught us what was needed um, I think for the league when you're playing against those teams and even our first game against Kerry I think we lost by two or three points and you're kind of we were a bit pissed off to be honest after the, the, the game just kind of acknowledging like we kind of maybe didn't go out full throttle because of who Kerry were that they're so so well known in ladies football and they were the senior team and kind of didn't want that to happen ever again throughout the season to be honest and to get a second chance at Kerry in the league final was for us was was unreal because we kind of got to show the progression and the the improvements we'd made in in a short period of time. What is the biggest jump between intermediate and, and senior championship what what's the biggest gap? Um, I think there's a lot of lot more physicality in senior level. Um, I think there's also um a lot more maybe. Mm, don't know how to say it exactly. I don't know. I think there's just a lot more a lot more involved in it. You know, I think you a lot of the teams that are there have been competing at the highest, like it is the highest level. So the teams that are there have been competing at the highest level for most of them significant a significant amount of years. So then the teams that are coming up are constantly having to adapt and change. And, you know, you're meeting a lot of different styles of plays. And yeah, I think the physicality is definitely one of the, one of the biggest elements that would have stood, stood out for me. I have to say a quick shout out to Ashley O'Reilly and off the ball. I think she was flying the mead flag all year, <laughs> telling everyone how good you were. Nobody listened to her. Um, for me, I actually found that Cork Championship group game probably the eye opener for, for your team. And I have to say, probably did underestimate you a little bit. But that game, f- do you think that really that helped the team? I know you you did have big aspirations, but was that really the realization when you were? I think you lost by one or two points. That you know this is we're really close here to this. Yeah, I think there was definitely a few moments throughout the year when you kind of, well, we we didn't stop to kind of acknowledge it, but you kind of subconsciously and in your own head, you're kind of saying like, look, like we're very, very close to these teams and it's that like those small margins that win games. So like, I think we were lucky to be able to go and analyse ourselves and analyse the other team and kind of see those small gaps and those small differences of what we could do. And maybe there was an element of people kind of underestimating us, but I think, you know, when you're on the pitch and you're in those tight games I think you know there's definitely mutual respect for for both teams throughout the year. Mm-hmm. 
that semi final, uh, pretty spectacular. I remember Emer being named player of the match, Emer Scali, and I remember sitting on the sofa being like, okay, this game's over, it's a Dublin Cork final, or I don't know if Dublin were in yet, but what can you describe the last couple of minutes that never say die attitude and then bringing it to extra time? Was it just did it did it really sink in at the time? Was it just next ball, next ball, get a score here? Yeah, I don't think there was. Uh, I don't know how much of a description I have of it. It was kind of that case of literally just not thinking and just doing as we practice. And you know, like obviously that's not a position you want to be in at the end of a game. You want to be on the opposite end of that and closing out a game. But it was just a case of just keep going and just don't stop and kind of see what happens. And obviously, like the, the it fell in our favor that day and we got those turnovers and those extra points and the momentum of extra time and stuff like that. But obviously, you know. If it was if it was my choice, I I wouldn't have that fairy tale stuff. I'd have a secure kind of win. I'd I'd much prefer that. But um, okay. obviously, it was, it's a great way to win in the end. Yeah, what's it like in the dressing room after realizing you're you're into the final? Yeah, it was um it was unreal um and just kind of you know I think we we scared ourselves a little bit and of maybe not getting there and then that kind of thought of not being there on that day definitely was was kind of something that we we acknowledged and obviously we were just excited to to get there and um kind of straight away switch into you know we thinking of Dublin brilliant there was a couple of uh, articles about the management approach I actually had Shane Wall on that episode will be out soon but uh there was a couple of different things spice bags rocks but I know for the final there was like a pre presentation kind of drawing on sort of inspirational characters that overcame adversity how how much preparation was was into the last couple of weeks before the final and can you talk talk us through a little bit of those effects of all of those um different elements that the management team brought away from football away from skills yeah um i don't i don't think um it'd be fair to say that like our management let's say did something completely different than other managers. I think, you know, like when you come up to a final, every management team try and play and team tries to do the utmost, you know. But I think the way it's the way the lads kind of did it, you know, I think they have a, they, they all have a really good bond with all of us on and off the pitch, you know. They I respect them all so much. And I think it's it's they respect all of us as well as players, but also humans as well. And they definitely have gotten to know us over the last few years. Um I think, yeah, just even um how Paul kind of approached it and just acknowledging, you know, that yes, we were underdogs and yes, all these things have come around, but also that it has been done before and that, you know, it is possible and stuff like that. And just even practicing every situation and, you know, any questions we had for the lads, like whether it was the stupidest questions that they'd answered 20 times or kind of a new question of a new scenario or a new kind of process you thought out, they'd come back to you straight away with kind of four or five different clips of different games and different scenarios and how things would, would kind of come out. And obviously it's sport, it's it's unpredictable. It's, it, you can't predict everything that's going to happen, but, you know, they prepared us the, the best they could. And, you know, we, I think that was really felt across the entire team that they had literally prepared us as much as they can. So it was kind of like, for us as well to to prove to them how well they prepare prepared us and what we could do as well. What sort of scenarios uh, would you practice at training? And how much time did you devote to the different scenarios that could crop up in a final? Oh, look, there's there's countless amount, um, and and some of them were just talked through, some of them were played through, and stuff like that. There's yeah, there was lots and lots and lots of scenarios you practiced, but it was just just I think it was just for us for ourselves, you know, to to kind of know when broad situations like how as a team we wanted to react and how we wanted to do things on the day and you know you, you talk about wanting to do things on the day but then actually doing them on the day is very different so it was kind of a, a balance of acknowledging that it, it wasn't going to go perfectly but being as, as well prepared as you could be. Uh, what sort of pre-game routine would you have Vicky is there anything specific you like to do are you superstitious or are you just kind of go with the flow? No, I'm not hugely superstitious. Um, I probably just like to take it handy if I can, you know, the day before a game. And we, we um, if we can, we like to get over to Evoke over in Des Moines and get, get some pancakes and stuff the day before a game. Just chill out for a few hours that morning, you know, just kind of with the girls and with the people that acknowledge that, you know, there's a big task at hand, but you kind of don't have to mention it hugely. and You don't have to, to be kind of having that conversation of, oh, you're looking forward to the game or whatever yeah. you're doing, which is obviously great, you know, when you get to chat to loads of people and meet loads of people. But at the same time, you know, the, the few hours before a game, you kind of want to just be chilling out. And then then I probably just do a, do a bit of kick on myself um, and then just eat lots of lots of food the day before. That That's about it. That's the extent of it. What, would, what sort of kicking would you do the day before? From what positions on the pitch, how many kicks would you would you take? 
Um, I suppose it depends. You just get the bag of balls, you know, go to the pitch and just kind of whether it like depends whether I'm going to be on freeze or it's just from open play and just kicking a few balls. It's just kind of just to to get out and do a bit of movement, but also not definitely not too strenuous. What would you, how often would you practice kicking away from the team, whether in season or off season? I know off season you obviously have more time, but how often would you practice by yourself? Um, I think it depends probably probably once or twice a week if I'm if it's a good week but then there's definitely weeks that I that I don't get out to the pitch and stuff and maybe you know there's weeks that it just be kind of an extra running session or more focus on gym and stuff like that so it's definitely something I could I could definitely do more and probably do want to do more this year but um yeah as, as much as possible I suppose um in terms of the final I know you texted Emma I think on the bus or on the way and you said we're going to win this match where, where did where did that belief come from for you? Was there any particular point in the lead up that season that just gave you this realization that you know we are going to win this game, we're going to win the senior championship? No, I don't think there's one. Um, I don't think there's one specific time or one specific match. I think it's an accumulation of little small moments um, throughout the year, and you know all those key learning moments. And you know against Cavan, I think it was a very tight game. And in previous years, I think we probably would have lost that game. I don't think we would have had the composure and the kind of football smarts to finish out that game. So you know when you do it once, you're kind of saying that's how you do it whereas like in previous years it was like we knew how to lose like we we just we were we were getting good at losing those kind of tight games by a point or two at the end so I think it was just all those small moments that accumulated and you kind of you start to realize like how to win and you know when it when when there's girls that come up like we had a lot of underage girls let's say that came up and they're used to winning as well and you have that mix of people that kind of were there for bad losses but also you know you have to have that short-term memory and just push that to a side Mm -hmm. and then kind of just 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 get used to to different scenarios as well and closing out games and stuff would you get nervous before a a big game um yeah I suppose like I think everyone gets nervous in kind of different ways like the day before a game I wouldn't really be hugely nervous it would kind of be maybe just that kind of 10 minutes before you're actually just you know the 10 minutes you're kind of floating around and walking around the dressing room but once I kind of sit down and start putting my shorts and socks and boots and stuff on and get into the warm-up on ground to be honest that's good you came out forward to it yeah exactly you came out in the final you started really well like you won the throw in uh you'd bursted forward you you won a free um directly in, the, in a great scoring zone just uh, around the d and you held the lead the whole game how important was that start in the final and was that something that was really emphasized coming into the game i think what was emphasized more so was maybe not letting dublin get that start so i think, okay. I think you know you're so con- like we kind of were so conscious of making sure that they didn't get that start that maybe kind of we just flipped on the other side of it look i suppose you can kind of ign- in different games we've been involved in before you, you acknowledge not wanting to let that team get that start I think everyone's in that position but you know it was just kind of we wanted to to set the mark I think from from the get-go mm-hmm. I won't ask about Emma's goal I think she, if she had a euro now for every time it was mentioned but how, what's it like being a club mate where her be, like I think someone said uh, it's bad enough having them on the same county team the, the club team is a bit of a cheat code now but what's it like what's it like having that type of cal- caliber of player and I think everyone kept saying she's 18 but she's 19 years of age yeah she's 19 nearly 20 now so we're, we can't <laughs> wait till she can't she's not referred to as her 18 year old but um I know like Emma is just a, a dream teammate to be honest she's um one of my closest friends but she's also just you know the type of person that like anyone would want in their team she's she's hard working and honest and she's also like one of the most naturally gifted footballers I've ever seen but you know she doesn't she hasn't gotten to where she is now at such a young age through true natural talent and you know like you talk about going up kicking balls and stuff for yourself like Dougie is up in that pitch like as uh, more than anyone I know and you know her dad's up there with her and stuff like that and she's just yeah she's just a phenomenal teammate to, to be um to be with to be honest. In the final um it was a very close game the entire time but what really impressed me was your work rate during the whole game from the very full forward to the to the full back and the goalkeeper at half time what was the dressing room like what was the messages like coming from the management? Um, yeah, half time I think was actually kind of kind of relaxed in some senses. Um, you know, we'd gotten to that stage and we were where we kind of wanted to be, and it was just a case of acknowledging that like there was a huge thirty minutes ahead, but that we had it in our legs and we had done the work all year, and those type of messages just kind of being solidified and kind of pushed around the dressing room a bit. At what stage in the match did you realise you uh, you were going to win the game? Was it that last few seconds, or was it kind of a couple of minutes ago? 
Um, I don't think I actually paused to kind of realize that yeah until maybe I looked up when I think there was like 42 seconds left to go because you know like if you flip it like we were that position we were in against Cork you know like as in a last minute goal like as in stuff can happen so 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 easily and so quickly so I think it was maybe until we had that ball on the, the sideline on the other side of the of Grove Park that I maybe had a, a small acknowledgement that we were going to win but it definitely was until the very last uh, whistle. The celebrations were obviously, obviously immense. I know you all did a bit of a uh, pile up on the pitch, but can you point point the difference that you think kind of made you champions this year? What was the what was the little things that you did? Was there any anything in particular you can kind of attribute to the to the win this year? Or well, sorry, I keep saying this year, last year. Sorry. Um, I don't think I don't think there's one thing or like. I can say that, like, why, why are champions? No, I don't I think if you could, like, everyone would win it, you know, that kind of way. It's not, it's not, you know, as, as simple as that. But I, I think it's just an accumulation of um, small, small, small things, you know, small changes that we've made and as a team, small things that we've wanted to achieve. And I think I mentioned already, but like just putting such an emphasis on friendship and kind of when you say putting an emphasis, emphasis on friendship, it maybe sounds like, you know, it's forced friendships, but it's not. It's kind of just like, just wanting to be there and wanting to do well for the girls around you like as in you know there's there's a huge acknowledgement of, like from my end anyway for for girls that we trained with year in year out that did the exact same sessions as I did that did the exact same gym sessions as I did that didn't get a jersey in Crow Park on the day you know that kind of place but it's like they have the exact same medal I do and rightly so you know like there's there's like a huge acknowledgement for that side of it as well and then also the girls that did get a jersey but didn't get to go, get on the pitch of Crow Park you know like hugely privileged to have being able to play that game and actually be on the pitch that day. So I think there's just like, there's um, you know, just like that friendship and that acknowledgement of like how hard the entire team is working. Like it's not just that the management are working hard to get us where we want to. It's not just that we're training hard to get where we want to. It's kind of, it's a bigger picture. It's a bigger group. It's, it's the entire team, like and team includes, you know, someone who steps in to do a physio session with us. Like those, everyone is involved, I think, in the entire process. That's something that a lot of players have spoken about is um when I mentioned even the A and B games, it's just you said it's just fifteen on fifteen and even the player that you're marking in training, the player that, that's pushing you for your jersey is playing as big a role on the day as, as you are on the pitch because without that person, you know, running at, running at you, training, pushing you to your very best, you wouldn't be the caliber of player you are. Yeah, one hundred percent. And like the the like I said, like on the day, like not everybody got a jersey, but as in like everyone was absolutely an equal equal member in our team. And, and I really, really think that that like that our entire team do believe that. So I think that's that's huge for us. You had an interesting role in the final. And I think it's interesting. I think the game is moving to sort of this positionless um, stage. The men's game is probably a little bit ahead. But for yourself, you were named corner forward, but... You didn't score that day. I think the corner back scored. Uh, she's putting a bit under pressure now, Emma Troy. She'd be looking for a corner forward spot. But um, what do you think is your, your best position? Um, you, you've been moving around a number of times and you play different roles, but what would you see as your, your favourite or best position? Um, I think it depends on who we're playing, to be honest, and how we're setting up and how they're setting up. I think, you know, I think I'll always be in and around that forward line, whether it's out towards the half forward midfield or if needed in, inside um yeah I think it, it kind of you know I think you have to be able to adapt I think um in the in football how it is now I think you have to really be able to play a couple of positions I don't think you can just rely and say you know I'm a I'm a full forward or I'm a full back I think you have to be able to play in across many different positions and I think a lot a lot of players kind of are getting to that stage now as well what do you think is your your biggest strength in your game Vicky what for you, what what do you think you know is that difference maker for you? What stands out as as your kind of go to? Um, good question. Um, I suppose maybe my strength. I suppose maybe getting out of out of um tackles maybe and out of kind of positions. I think other people can probably rely heavily on maybe skill and stuff like that. Um, which I hope I, I can as well in some senses. But yeah, I'd say I'd say maybe my strength. Okay. I was impressed with you in 2020, obviously Intermediate Player of the Year, but I actually thought you reached this new level last year. What did you work on during the break? I know you you's had like individual plans, but for you coming into 2021, what do you what did you elevate the most? What was your focus on improving as an as an individual? 
Um, yeah, as an individual, I suppose naturally, like I would be quite strong, but it was a case of like, you know, really had to hone that and still work on it in the gym, like as in you're still wanting to get better every single time. But maybe I kind of put less of a focus on the gym and more on my running and fitness and endurance. I suppose that was an area that I felt that I could definitely improve on. Still think it is and um, still want to achieve higher in that kind of area. Um, so I suppose that was something that I was conscious of. And maybe if if the role I knew I'd be playing would kind of be more out towards the the ladder or the middle area of the pitch that you know you kind of you are moving more and you're on the ball more so it was definitely something that I wanted to to improve on at the all-star awards um you got a bit emotional I think when they were naming you as senior player of the year was that the kind of moment where it hit you of there's there's so many amazing things that's happened this year and this is kind of you know not real but it's kind of like pinch me moment at this stage um yeah I definitely was a bit emotional I, I definitely didn't think I was going to win that to be honest um like and I think people say that but I actually just didn't um I think I don't I don't think I kind of have fully reflected and I don't think I kind of want to for a while I think if you stop and kind of start looking back on all those things um it's easy to get distracted you know for us and for me then for me like 2021 was unbelievable but 2021 like for me is is so so done um you know like the the shift and like obviously we were back with our club straight away but you know like I don't want to be the player of the year, player of the year last year and kind of and not not prove myself because I don't think I do have to prove myself to anyone but myself but I think like I want to achieve new things this year I want to push myself further so it's kind of a case of maybe acknowledging and saying yeah like that's great and it is great but maybe it's a case of not looking back for until till until a few years maybe kind of an acknowledgement because I want to keep going I want to keep achieving with me then with Dumboyan and any team I'm involved with. Okay, that's fascinating because since doing the interviews, that's kind of that like high performance mindset of you don't really switch off because I've written here there's 13 or 14 accolades you got in 2021. Do you, do you find it hard to kind of switch off in that mentality or like even I was asking someone, you know, do they, you know, how hard is it to walk off the pitch with no regrets? And she said, you're always going to have regrets as a, as a high performer. Um, I don't think it's it's hard to switch off as in like over Christmas and let's say like you know we had our few weeks to to relax and stuff like that and I was it was easy not easy but as in you know I was still doing my gym and still doing bits and pieces but you know you're able to kind of switch off from that side but then it's also on the flip side very easy to to be focused and be in it when you are in it um and I think it's kind of the people you surround yourself with and you know the girls you're with and if, if people have a similar goal it's kind of easy to stay in that mind frame whereas I think if people don't you kind of question yourself and like w- whether it's worth it and all those other kind of things but yeah I think you know like I don't think anyone's ever going to have a perfect match and I think I kind of agree with that and regrets in some ways but but maybe it's not you know your regrets on the pitch it's kind of regretting let's say if you haven't done stuff before it so that's something that I've maybe have felt strongly in previous years you know specifically that Tipperary match you know I think I did a lot of self-reflection after that and it, it was kind of yeah I was disappointed at the loss but I was more disappointed in like I felt I hadn't done enough myself the year of kind of pushing myself and achieving the standards that I that I knew I was capable of so it's kind of kind of that flip side of it as well. Okay interesting um for any of the younger listeners that are um kind of tuning in and watching you guys what does it take to be an intercounty player is there you know a checklist is kind of the wrong word but is there just a couple of things that stand out st- that stood out to you? Um I think it's yeah I, I think most of it is is a mindset you know I think people have I think a lot of people have the the physical ability to do it um, and to do the training and to stuff but it's you know it's turning up on those Sunday mornings at half seven when you're you're wrecked you know it's it's putting that fo- extra focus on your sleep or extra focus on your nutrition you know it's not you know I think a lot of people can turn up to those three pitch sessions two gym sessions a week and you know put that aside and say yeah that's great I'm kind of done for this week but it's like it's all this for me like being an intercounty football player is all the small things you do outside of it. Mm-hmm. what small things do you do that you um, attribute your ability to on the pitch um I suppose yeah just in the last few years just a, a lot stronger a focus on nutrition and hydration and sleep and just kind of actually prioritizing those prioritizing those things um and it's absolutely not perfect all the time and it's absolutely a work in progress and finding what works for you as well just those yeah just maybe small marginal things and just even mindset and you know we have a sports psychologist so maybe using her more often than I would have and just kind of utilizing all of the resources we have like recovery even and stuff like that for yourself Vicky what motivates you more success or failure um I think 
I, I don't know whether it's one more than the other. You know, I, I've learned a huge amount from about myself and about our team through losses. But then when you get that taste of success, like it's that's so motivating and so driving to continue to to get it and not wanting to get back to to, to that failure. So I think a, a good mixture of both. What would be your personal definition of success? Um, reaching your potential, I think. Um, you know, setting standards and setting setting um like a culture for yourself maybe is how I kind of would all I view as success. Brilliant. What's been the biggest lesson um that you've learned from sport, whether is it through the team or through your individual career? I think one of the biggest lessons is I've learned is that you really have to look after yourself. Um, and I know it's, it kind of maybe sounds a bit hypocritical because it's a team sport, but you know, I'm only useful, not only useful, but I'm most useful to the team when I'm fully fit and I'm fully injury free. So it's a case of, you know, like having that confidence to say like, I'm, I'm not fit to train today. Like as in it's the case of taking an extra session out to know that I'll be back for the rest of the season rather than rushing back and stuff like that. So maybe being selfish and from an injury point of view and those type of things to, to prolong the longevity of my career rather than, you know, two extra sessions that maybe aren't needed. Mm -hmm. at the moment there's huge um discussion around bringing in more physicality into the game but at the moment what would you see as the most underrated skill i think um there's kind of it's coming in more so into his kind of like longer kickouts and stuff like that in the ladies game i think you know we see it a, a huge amount in the men's game um but i think yeah i think it's probably a bit of an underrated skill you know that high catch and the long kick out who's been your toughest opponent so far whether in the mead setup or at uh, intercounty or college level um I suppose maybe in training, the Katie knew for me, there's always, you know, she's a stickler. She's tough to get by. She's a very hands-on as well. Um, I think from college as well, Leah Caffrey is, is unbelievable as well. She's definitely definitely a sticky pair to, to get away from as well. Brilliant. 2022 season, uh, the league is starting this weekend against Cork. A uh, bit of a good matchup now from the semi-final, but how has the approach for the team shifted that you're now champions? I know you mentioned you're leaving 2021 in 2021, but the pack are now chasing you guys. You're not chasing anybody. What What's that like? Well, yeah, I think it's a chance to improve and prove yourself and, you know, show you like we want to be where we are. So it's a case of like, if we're not good enough, we won't be where we are, you know, that kind of way. So it's a case of of continuously being consistent and proving proving ourselves to ourselves. You're still young. You've plenty of football ahead. So I'm not retiring you. But when you do eventually stop playing, what type of player do you want to be remembered for? Um, hard, I wanted to remember to be hardworking and um, to to have an and to have an impact on the game to to you know to be able to have those impacts in, uh, a big impact on the game brilliant i'm going to move on to the sideline seven i'm just conscious of time uh, it's the same seven questions for every guest a uh, question one what is your favorite quote um good question um i think maybe in context of sports is that you'll be retired for long enough so enjoy it while you can brilliant a uh, question two what's the best sporting event you've been to and i know the answer as a player but if there's one as a fan that you really enjoyed yeah, I actually always really enjoy the Camogie all Ireland. I really like, you know, I think it's it's a lot of the time we're playing on the same weekends and stuff like that, so you don't get to go to the matches. So I think first as a spectator, I really, really enjoy getting to go into them. Did you play Camogie growing up? No. no. I didn't, so. no. <laughs> Would you give it a try? <laughs> I don't know about that, no. <laughs> uh, question three, what's been the biggest setback or challenge so far in your career and how did you react to it? Yeah, I think we kind of touched on it as well, of our relegation to Division 3 and Intermediate, you know, and kind of just being patient and building back up and kind of getting to where we want to be. Question four, what's been your biggest achievement on or off the pitch? I think on the pitch it is very, um, very obvious. It's the, you know, the senior all Ireland this year or last year even. Um, off the pitch, I'd say, yeah, college, you know, graduating college and stuff like that, probably. Brilliant. Looking back, what advice would you give your 18-year-old self studying for her English mocks on the way home from Limerick? <laughs> Um, I'd say to probably enjoy it a little bit more, you know, when you get to that adult level, I think it's easy to kind of maybe be a bit too too strict maybe and stuff like that and overthink it all just to enjoy the process really and, you know, acknowledge that it's sport and that it's not going to be, it's not going to go your way all the time, but that, you know, just, just to enjoy it all. Question six, who would be your dream dinner guest and why? And you can open the table to a few people if you want. Yeah, I was thinking about this one. Um, I think I'm going to go for Serena and Venus Williams. I've always been fascinated by them and just, you know, that sister dynamic of seeing them when they were younger playing against each other at Wimbledon. I've just been fascinated by it. Brilliant. Final question before I let you go. If your life was a book, what chapter would this be called? 
um, I think I'd call it consistency. Okay, brilliant. Vicky, thank you so much for coming on. The very best of luck next season and beyond. And thanks again. Thanks, Millian. A massive thank you to Vicky for joining me on the podcast today. I thoroughly enjoyed our chat and I hope you got something from it. I just want to wish her and all of her mead teammates the very best of luck with the upcoming season. If you are enjoying the podcast, I'd really appreciate if you leave a rating and a review over on Apple Podcasts and Spotify as it does help the show grow. A massive thank you to Phil Queens for sponsoring the series and as always, thanks to you for listening.